starting yet. All right. So we're not starting yet, but the attack is up on the board. So see if you can. Uh, so here's what I'll say about this in order to understand it. Well, you know, it just describes it anyways. You look at it and see if you can see what uh, what I'm trying to imply here about. Maybe scroll it down a little bit. See the uh, captions. All right, it is time to start again, and we'll take you right up till five. But before we leave segmentation and interrupts and stuff like that, I want to talk about this recent uh, variant attack that I found. Okay, so in a normal, so when we had like that break on through to the other side, we did what I'll call normal interrupt descriptor table hooking. What we did is we went into the IDT, we went to index EE, right? So we took the size of each entry. So the kernel module says, okay, read the IDTR to find the base address of the IDT. Whatever thing you want to hook, you take and you say that index, EE, times the size of each entry, right, 8. So you add those together, you add the base plus 8 times EE, and that's where there should be an interrupt descriptor, right? It should have, an, it should have a logical address in it, as well as DPL and stuff we don't, we don't care about. The issue is, in normal hooking, how kernel rootkits and other, you know, third-party software do it, is they go into the IDT and they change that 32-bit offset, right? And that works fine because base is always zero for the normal IDT. So you change the 32-bit offset and now you point at your new code, right? So if you go back and you hit the bang IDT, you see that, yeah, this new address is break on through to the other side plus whatever. That's how normal things do it and that's how normal you know, rootkit detectors look at this. So if you get some of the best detectors like Gmer, Toluca, they go through and they check the IDT by checking each of these 32-bit offset fields out of that, you know, 64-bit descriptor. And so the issue is, what we found was, instead of doing that, let's go ahead and leave that 32-bit offset which they're checking, that they're checking. Let's leave that the same, but instead let's change the segment selector so that it selects just some random segment here. I just took like hex 50 as an index into the GDT, so hex 50 shifted by three bits to the left is 280. So I took index 50 and I changed it to have a base of, you know, 777 seven, seven, whatever, but the whole point of setting the base was so that base plus the existing unchanged 32-bit offset equals the linear address where my attack code is, right? So back here, just straight up change the 32-bit address you get to your attack code when someone calls the interrupt. Here, leave the address the same, change the segment selector, and create a new segment which has a base which is non-zero. And when you add that non-zero base to the 32-bit you know, offset, you get the address of the attacker's code. And the really interesting thing here is that this technique can actually be used to go from, you can leave your 32-bit offset the same and get to an address which is negative relative to it. So, this one is a little, I could have written this fourth box two different ways, but what I'm trying to show here is, let's say that the attacker is still trying to get to the same linear address, right? He could have changed the 32-bit offset to, you know, some new address, which is 7, uh, F7E something, 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 but he's trying to get to F7D something, something, something. And by setting the base to FFF0000, you take F, 7E dot 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 plus FFF and you add those together and it wraps around the 32-bit address space and you now are at F7D dot dot dot. So the reason that negative one is very interesting is because, you know, in the case of the existing kernel handlers, they're typically at address ranges like 80 something and the kernel module gets loaded at some higher address. So yeah, positive hooking, yeah, you just need to have a base address, which is sort of the difference between your high address and the kernel's low address. But what if you're trying to hook some third-party software, which got installed at the system on a high address too? And what if you got a lower high address than it, right? So now you're trying to hook this, but you're literally lower than it. You need some way to, sorry, you're, 
you're trying to hook this, but you're literally lower than it, but you still want to leave this 32-bit offset the same. So that's what was, you know, ambiguous about this fourth thing. I could have also shown a picture. And it wraps around to 804 something, something, something. It's just that in this context, 804 means nothing to me other than that it's negative relative to the existing thing. So the point is, if that existing thing were some other third party software which got loaded at a high address and you got loaded at a lower address, the fact that you can wrap around the entire 32 bit segment space and pop back in on the negative side, negative relative to what's already there, that's very interesting and potentially a bug. Not sure. We're, uh, I emailed Intel about that and we'll find it. So that was, uh, this is the little variant showing that, you know, I can either go positive or negative from the existing 32-bit offset by just setting either, you know, a really big or a sort of small base address to some new segment which I'm selecting from. So that, that base plus the existing is positive to the existing or negative to the existing. This was sort of interesting. And again, you could only understand this sort of attack and this paper here if you understand segmentation and interrupts to the level that you get in this class. Which is why even, you know, the really good rootkit detectors didn't, uh, didn't look at the full logical address, right? It's not that much harder to look at the full logical address because those segment selectors are always selecting segment eight. They're always selecting the kernel code segment. And so an easy defense for this sort of attack is just if you're a detector, you go through and you look at every interrupt entry that's not a trap gate or task gate, rather. You go through and look at them all and you say, is one of them suspiciously not pointing to the normal code segment, which goes zero to FFF, right? And so every interrupt entry should always point to a descriptor which describes zero to FFF, that sort of thing. So easy to defend against. And, uh, and so we contacted some vendors to hopefully get them to detect this before this paper is made public if we get accepted to use Anyways, the point is you're now lead enough to understand my position. All right. Moving on to debugging quickly. All right. So the last topic we can cover for today, unfortunately, well, we're going to try to get through I.O., but we may just cheat and just show you it for the sake of showing it to you. All right. So we already learned that IAT3 is the breakpoint exception or breakpoint interrupt. And there is a one byte form of breakpoint at CC. So if you put in a CC and that, you know, code executes CC, it's going to be interrupt three and it's going to vector to the kernel. And the kernel will then, you know, have to pass that to a debugger if one exists. So in reality, any time that you just ask a debugger for like a normal breakpoint, typically, you know, in almost every case, it should be using this software breakpoint. Because you can set an unlimited number of software breakpoints, right? You just hack in these CC bytes wherever you want the debugger to stop. And so how the software would do it, when we click the little icon over to the side of the thing, it, the, you know, debugger says, okay, what assembly line corresponds to this location in the C source code? And for that assembly line, go ahead Take a copy of the first byte of that assembly instruction, you know, an opcode byte or whatever. Overwrite it with CC. And when you're running around down through your assembly, you hit bang, CC, interrupt, gets called back. You know, the OS talks back to the debugger. Debugger catches the interrupt and says, okay, what do you want to do, human? Continue. Step one instruction. What are you going to do? If you say, you know, step one instruction or, con or, um, or just continue in general, it's going to replace that CC temporarily with the original byte, execute the original instruction, and then, you know, once again, take it out, put the CC back. It depends on if you, you know, you turned off the breakpoint or not, but if the breakpoint's still on, it's going to put back the original byte, execute the instruction, and put back the CC so that if you have like a loop or something like that, that every time through the loop you hit the breakpoint. So the thing is, debuggers hide this from you. They hide the fact that when you ask them for a breakpoint, whether it's WinDebug or GDB or Visual Studio, when you ask them for a breakpoint at a specific memory address, they have overwritten that one byte at that address with CC. And then they just expect to catch that later. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a little lab where 
We're going to set the breakpoint, we're going to look at the instruction, and then we're going to look at it in the memory window, and it's not going to show a CC because it's hiding it from you. It shows you the byte sequence for the instruction which should have been there. But if we write special code which reads our own memory and prints out what we see, then we can get around this fact that it's hiding it from us because we really are reading our own memory and we see that CC. This is proof pudding. Yes. Yes. Right? So this is, again, going towards an anti-debug check. They don't, you know, necessarily check one byte at a time. They will, for instance, create a checksum over an entire range of memory, right? So there's, for instance, there's a dedicated CRC cyclic, redund cyclic redundancy check instruction in the Intel instruction set. So you can say, like, take all of this memory range, CRC it together, and if the CRC does not match the clean code, then somebody's stuck a breakpoint in there somewhere, right? And so then they can issue different code. So yes, it definitely is used as an anti-debug trick, and we're now going to get around the debugger's lies. And we can just do this from outside of the VM if we want, or inside, doesn't matter. In Visual Studio, you want to set uh, proof pudding as the startup project. And we're just going to look at it really quick. So this is going to be a little complex. And yeah, uh, John Erickson suggested a way that I could make this a little less complex here. But this hard-coded instruction I've generated here, E8000, this is actually a call instruction. And it's calling zero bytes past the next instruction. So we know that we can have relative calls where it's saying, you know, it's just like relative jumps, relative calls. You can say, I want you to go however many bytes past the next instruction. And if I say go zero bytes past the next instruction, it means it functionally just jumps down to the next instruction, but the side effect is that, like any call, the address of the next instruction is put onto the stack. So you're calling the next instruction, which is kind of like pushing the EIP of the next instruction, and then that next instruction can go ahead and pop that back off the stack and, you know, you can start trying to read it. You can pop it into a register and put the register into a local variable, and then in that way, you have uh, read the address at the next instruction. And you can also, you know, hard code some offsets into there, add or subtract from that. So, call zero, so you just call the next instruction. The next instruction is a pop EAX instruction, which turns out to be a single literal opcode byte of 58. Anytime you have pop EAX, it is the byte 58. That's where I want you to set your breakpoint, right? So what I'm claiming is when you set a breakpoint on this pop EAX, the debugger is going in there and taking this 58 and replacing it with the CC, but keeping a copy off to the side so that it knows how to, like, put it back when it wants to actually execute the instruction. So whether it's a one-byte instruction or a five-byte instruction, doesn't matter. The first byte gets overwritten with the CC. And so what we're going to see is we set the breakpoint on pop EAX, Put the breakpoint at the very end on return feeble. And so now the point is when we execute this, we expect it to say, so it popped the address of this right here, this own, its own instruction, and then it's moving it to a pointer and it's printing out the pointer and stuff like that. So when we run this with a debugger enabled, we expect this to say, well, okay, let's run it once without the debugger. And we expect this to say 58. It sees 58 because that's what a pop is. So hit F5 to run. We run it once. We look at the uh, output window. It says the proof is in the pointer hex 58. Okay, so no breakpoint. We are correct. Pop EAX is hex 58. All right, go ahead and stop it. Oh, man, I just destroyed my window probably. Someone else did this earlier. Well, go ahead and set a breakpoint on, uh, now set a breakpoint on pop EAX and just run it again, and then step past the breakpoint, or just continue when you hit the breakpoint, and then uh, you should see it's saying CC. Yeah, there we go. Okay, good. So, right, this is the key point which um, is often not understood by people when they're trying to understand how the, um, what the complete flow is from interrupt back to debugger, right? So 
So in order for the interrupts to get to the right place, right, an OS typically has to export some sort of debugging API where it says, look, if you want to, if you want to debug someone, you need to register as a debugger for this process. So that when I get a debug breakpoint or a, you know, software breakpoint or a hardware breakpoint, when I get a hardware or software breakpoint, I don't know what to do with it, right? So that happened. If you as a debugger want to actually handle that and like, you know, manipulate your data however you want to, you need to register to me the OS so that when this breakpoint fires, I know to call you back. I can see, oh, you got a breakpoint, let me check the EIP. Because, you know, EIP gets pushed on the stack anytime we got an interrupt. Check the EIP, you know, which process was running at the time. You know, check my CR3 that was, uh, CR3 doesn't get changed. Like we said before, we go kernel to user space, whatever. The CR3 doesn't actually change. And so, um, so the OS needs to know who to tell about this, right? If there's no debugger registered, it just considers it like, you know, an invalid breakpoint. It'll just, you know, crash the program. But if there's a debugger registered, Visual Studio here has said to the OS, hey, I'm acting as a debugger for this process. Call me back when any sort of int ones or int threes occur. And so that's the full flow. Right here, you click on the side that fills in a CC. You step through the code one instruction at a time, and when it hits the CC, it transfers to the interrupt descriptor table, goes to index three, looks at the offset and the segment selector, it selects the kernel segment, selects the offset, which is just the, you know, default handler for interrupt breakpoints. And that default handler then says, do I know about any, you know, debuggers which have registered themselves right now? And if so, then okay, you know, which process did this occur in? Who's the registered debugger? And I will go ahead and tell the registered debugger for this process, hey, you've got an interrupt and it occurred at this address. Go ahead and run registered debugger. So instead of passing control back to the program, they pass control to the registered debugger. And that's the part which is not implemented in any sort of hardware specification thing. Like, the OS has to come up with some sort of API by which you can say, I want to debug this now. So anyways, I'll run mine one more time. And actually, I'm going to stop here where it says pop EAX. Because I know at that point, EAX holds the address of that instruction. So I'm going to put it into a memory window and literally, like, try to see that it's CC, but uh, the debugger is going to lie to me. So I start my debugger. I'm stopped here at pop EAX. And I know that immediately after I execute this, so I'm going to step one instruction, I know that after I've executed this, EAX holds the address of the pop EAX instruction. So if I take that address and I put it into a memory window by going bug windows memory, put that in, press return, But in reality, we read our own memory, we printed out our own memory, and we see that our own memory is CC. So that's how we know that yes, software breakpoints are interrupt. Int software breakpoints are implemented by debuggers as shoving a CC byte in there. And if you want, you know, a, a technique which sometimes is useful to malware analysts is if you want something to hit a breakpoint, you don't like. Uh, if you're going to load something up and you want it to eventually break at some specific location, say that entry point, uh, which is specified in the PE headers, you can hard code a CC into the literal binary on disk. And when it gets loaded up, as long as that CC was in, you know, some code section and along it, as long as you knew that it was like the start of an instruction and not, you know, you're not corrupting the middle of an instruction or something. And when the CPU loads it, you know, OS loads it up into memory, starts executing it, when it hits that CPU, It'll just go ahead and, you know, call whatever debugger is registered. And for instance, things like IDA can say, I want to be registered for any process. If any process that has a breakpoint, let me know. And so you can hack in a CC in the file on disk, register IDA as I want to debug everything, and then go ahead and run the file and it'll eventually hit. That's a trick which has utility in some cases. It's typically you're going to go from within IDA, you're just going to say, I want to start this process. And IDA will just automatically set a breakpoint on the very first instruction, the, the uh, address of entry point as found in the PE headers. 
All right, so that was proof pudding showing that software interrupts are done with CC. All right, so finally, we want to talk about uh, hardware support for debugging. So those were software breakpoints, and we call that that because you're putting in a software instruction. Hardware breakpoints are a way that the hardware will actually automatically for you check if you are meeting some condition on a virtual memory access. So the hardware will say for every virtual memory access, is this, am I executing at this virtual memory address? Am I reading from this virtual memory address? Or am I writing to this virtual memory address? And if you've set a hardware breakpoint where you say, dear hardware, execute an interrupt three, no, sorry, interrupt one, debug breakpoint, interrupt Execute and interrupt one when you see any virtual address trying to execute that address or this address. If you ever see anyone trying to read to this virtual address, cause an interrupt. If you see anyone ever trying to write to this virtual address, cause an interrupt. And even you can set it on like port IO. So if you're trying to talk to devices, you can say, tell me, give me an interrupt when someone's trying to talk out on this port. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have enough time to talk about port IO because that was the next section. So. But anyways, just so you're aware of that capability. So the thing is, though, you're very limited with hardware breakpoints because there's essentially four registers where you can specify a virtual memory address that you want these breakpoints to occur on. So you can set up to four hardware breakpoints where the hardware will just automatically be checking, am I currently at this virtual address and am I doing an execute? Am I doing a read? Am I doing a write? Which goes back to those notions of the hardware knows whether it's executing, the hardware knows whether it's reading or writing. All right, so typically you have to look for this explicitly in the documentation. If you just say, give me a breakpoint, you're going to get a software breakpoint because the debugger can set an unlimited number of those, as many CCs as you have instructions. If you want a hardware breakpoint, you have to find the specific thing. We'll see for WinDebug what it is. Uh, there is technically a way to set it in Visual Studio, I think, but I almost never use it in there. If you go to GDB, I think, Hardware breakpoints are secretly behind the scenes. They're called like watches or something like that. So you're going to have to look at the documentation to find out. But there should be some hint in there saying, you know, you're setting. If, if it tells you that you can set a breakpoint on read or breakpoint on write, then you have to be dealing with a hardware breakpoint because those software breakpoints aren't going to know anything about reads or writes. So there's some specific registers which control these. And knowing these uh, registers, one, as a good guy, you could set your own breakpoints when you want. And as a bad guy, knowing these registers, you can just wipe them out so that the debugger never catches any hardware breakpoints, right? So you may, you as a reverse engineer may be saying, oh, well, I want to set a breakpoint on this virtual address. And because I know, you know, the attacker is writing to that virtual address. And I want to know when he writes to that virtual address. And you say, okay, set the breakpoint, go. Right? And then the attacker in his code may have some instruction which says, okay, clear all the debug registers. Right? And then none of those hardware breakpoints are going to fire. So you have to be aware of the capabilities and limitations of hardware breakpoints in the context of malicious code. So first of all, accessing the debug registers requires, technically requires CPL0. Uh, so it's a register to register thing. Again, you've got these 32-bit registers and you can move from EAX to them or from EAX. The instructions for the actual moves require CPL0. It turns out on Windows, for instance, it exposes, in, remember in those mega data structures for thread information and process information? It, uh, it turns out that Windows exposes information about your thread context right now. And some of the fields that it exposes are the debug register fields. So if you and your user space process change those debug register fields in your context, then when you get context switched out and context switched back, Right? So you set those in your, you know, hacked version of calc.exe. You've just broken into calc.exe. You as the malicious person have changed the thread context to set some hardware breakpoint. You got swapped out because notepad turned to run. And you got swapped back in. When you get swapped back in and the kernel is swapping in all your context, it's setting these debug registers based on that. So, uh, it is the case that user space code on Windows anyways can set the debug registers even though you're supposed to only be able to do it from ring zero. I don't know if there's anything equivalent on Windows, uh, Linux. All right, so 
if, right, there's technically eight registers. DR4 and 5 are not even used. So DR0 through 3, these are the four registers where you can set an address where you want to break. And then DR6 is status. This tells you when a break happens, you need to go check the status register to find out what kind of breakpoint happened. Was it read break? Was it a write break? Because you could set maybe two breakpoints on the same virtual memory address, and maybe one of them is a break on execute, and the other is a break on read. And so you have to check the status register to know which of those just fired. Did someone just write to my instruction, or did someone just execute my instruction? The status flags in the status register will tell you. And then finally, DR7, the control register. This is just saying turn on or off breakpoints on the virtual address in 0, the virtual address in 1, 3. It also will say things like turn on execute breakpoints, turn on read breakpoints, turn on uh, write breakpoints, read write breakpoints, anyways. So those are the straight up values. So 0 through 3, just plug in any virtual address, and that'll say here's where I want to break. And then up in the control register, that's where you need to say whether you enable it or not. And if you do enable it, what type is it? And what size of memory do you want to break point? You can break, you can say, I only want to break if that virtual address, one byte, one byte at that virtual address has changed. Or you may say, I want to break if anywhere in four bytes after that virtual address have changed. You can go one, two, four, and on some systems, eight bytes at the virtual address. If anywhere within those bytes, execute or read or write, then it'll break. So here's the control register. The key points are, there's two different things. One of them is called local enable, and the other is called global enable. Local has to do with task switches, which we said we mostly don't care about. So if you switch tasks using Intel's task switch notion, this local enable stuff gets cleared. So you may locally enable in this task that I want a breakpoint on that virtual address, and you switch over to that one, that task, and you don't want that breakpoint to still be in effect, right? So local enable is saying, like, let's lock it down to here. As I said, the Windows doesn't really use task switching, so in reality, you're always in the same task except for a few of those weird interrupts and stuff. So but the point there would be, it's sort of like GDT, LDT, right? So local could be per process if you want it to be, local descriptor table. Global is for everyone, right? So if you say global enable, it doesn't matter which process you're in right now, it's going to break on that virtual address. So you could see how in user space, for instance, if you could turn on, you know, break on virtual address this, but then it turns out you got swapped over to some other process context, you'd be breaking where you didn't actually care about it. So anyways, local versus global is just global is always in effect. You turn it on in global, it doesn't matter which process you're in. Well, it's about tasks. And since you're always in one task anyways, it doesn't matter. Local is clear out the stuff if you switch tasks. And do, do, do. Yeah, these are just some um, LE stand for, I don't know, local exact and global exact, something like that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I can read. Local exact and global exact are saying in the specific case of a data breakpoint. Typically, on a data breakpoint, it's going to break at the instruction after the data was written to, right? So the data is going to be written, there's going to be an interrupt, and the EIP is going to point at the instruction afterwards. And what kind of uh, fault, trap, or abort, what kind of interrupt is that? If I'm saying data usually is the EIP points at the address after. Trap. All right. And so the point is, in some cases, you may really want to say, like, the actual instruction which caused the write, I want to know that instruction. So in those cases, there's ways you can flip bits to say, I want to know exactly the instruction which caused the write, and I want that guy's EIP instead of the EIP after. Yes. Yes, basically. It's causing an attack as a fault instead of a trap. And that's why if you go back to that, here's all of Intel's defined things. There was fault slash trap. And there's, there's another reason as well. All right, then there's general detect. This one's sort of interesting. <clears throat> this is trying to be a protection mechanism for debug registers, but I don't think it actually works. General detect flag, you set that to one, and that says, I want to now cause an interrupt if someone tries to touch my debug registers. So it's like, 
I'm going to set up the debug registers. And I'm going to set general to text. So if someone tries to move into my debug registers, I want to cause an interrupt. I want to catch that interrupt. And I want to say, uh-uh, no. You know, kill whoever tried to touch my debug registers, right? Off with their head. The reason this wouldn't really necessarily work in kernel space is because why can't the attacker just go hook your interrupt one to make it so that, yes, I can't touch your registers, but then it vectors to interrupt one, and that vectors to attacker code. And at that point, they can just, you know, turn off the, uh, the general attack. Because obviously, your code also has to have a way to turn off the general attack. You can't have it be that, you know, you get locked down, like, forevermore. Not even you may do it. So in the context of uh, the interrupt handler, uh, yes, it can reset this flag. So hackers can get around that. But certainly for sanity checking purposes, again, it is good to know if two debuggers are trying to fight over the hardware breakpoints, right? And to be able to, you know, context switch between them potentially. There's only four of them for everyone, right? So uh, if you, if you're, if this debugger expects exclusive access to those debug breakpoints, and if, you know, it's being context switched out or something like that, then uh, you have to have a way to, well, to make sure that things don't uh, smash each other's hardware breakpoints. All right, finally, this RW0 through 3, this is essentially telling, this is, remember, we're on the control register, and this is telling the hardware, yeah, we're not actually finally, this is telling the hardware what type of action do I want you to break on. So the local enable, global enable, we're saying which of those DR0 through DR3 do I want you to care about the virtual address for. So the hardware will check for every virtual address. It will go over and check the hardware breakpoint DR0 through DR3 and say if local enable is set to 0, or if local enable is 0, is set to 1, for instance, and it says, Dear hardware, please enable checking against debug register zero. So it says check every virtual address against the virtual address I have put into debug register zero. Right? So local enable this flag, L0, turns on you know, hardware checking this. This flag, L1, turns on hardware checking this, et cetera. Right? But for each of those, then you have to tell the hardware, when do I want you to actually issue the thing? So it may see, okay. This is enabled, and I'm checking this debug register, 0 through 3. But what type of breakpoint do I actually want? So this R0 through, R, this RW0 through RW3 are interpreted as follow, right? So there's this right here, RW0. If these two bit, bits are set to 0, 0, it's telling the hardware, please break when you see that someone is trying to access this virtual memory address as an instruction. If you are trying to execute code at this location, Hardware, I want you to issue an interrupt one. If this uh, RW0 is set to zero one, it says, if you, the hardware, are seeing someone is trying to read, or sorry, write only to this uh, virtual address, which I've specified in debug register zero, if you're trying to write there, hardware, please, uh, please give me an interrupt, let me know about that. Then this one is potentially undefined. The one zero case is maybe undefined, but in other cases, it's about input output on this port IO. So you can actually say, if someone is trying to talk out to some peripheral via port IO, I want to know about it. I want to intercept that. Finally, one one is for breaks on reads or writes, but not execution. So unfortunately, well, it's, you know, could say you could go either way, but I would say this is for purposes of conserve. No, that's not true. Okay. You have a break on write only, and you have a break on read or write, but you have no break on read only, right? So if you just want to know when someone read that data, you can't do it. You need to set a break on read and write, a break on read, and then you need to end up, those should both fire at the same time, and you check status flags. Did they both fire? Did one of them fire, but not the other? And if one of them fired, but not the other, maybe it's a read. That's neither here nor there, because as far as I'm aware right now, no debugger is exporting the ability to break on read. So, but if you wanted it, you could, you know, burn two of your four debug registers, and so you can have two break on read only uh, sort of interrupts. All right, and so the final part of the control is saying, 
for what virtual memory range do I care about this breakpoint? So you can say break on execute only if it is within one byte of the address I specified. So if I say 800 whatever, and if someone tries to execute the first byte there, then I care. If I set the size to four bytes, then if someone tries to execute the first byte, or if someone tries to execute the second byte, or if someone tries to execute the third, or anyone tries to execute the fourth, for any of those four bytes, it'll still cause an interrupt. So it's really just about regions. Because you can think of cases, this is probably, well, I should say explicitly in the context of executes, uh, it doesn't make as much of sense. And, as, and because of that, Windebug doesn't even give you the ability to say one versus four. Windebug says you may only set an execute breakpoint on one byte, and you better give it the first byte of an instruction, because otherwise it's not going to Well, maybe it will. This one versus four or two, this makes more sense in data access ones, right? Let's say you've got a data structure, it's all compressed together, and there's a short field in it, right? There's a C short, that's a two byte field. You want to set that size to two so that if there's a short and another short, but you only want to see when that short is written, and you don't want to see when the next one is, you can't set that to four, otherwise it'll break on writes to either of them. You've got to set that size to two so that you can check, you know, a single character or a single short or a D word, for instance. Or maybe you have, you know, four characters and you don't care if any of them are hit and you just set it like that. So, in terms of functionalities that the control register gives us, we've got four debug registers we put a virtual address into. That's debug 0, 1, 2, and 3. So you set up a 0, 1, 2, or 3. You turn them on by saying local label or global enable 0, 1, 2, or 3. You set the type by saying RW is 0, 0 for break on instruction, 0, 1 for break on read, or sorry, write, 1, 0 for break on I.O., in which case the, the virtual address, right, in that uh, DR0 would actually be a, an I.O. port. It wouldn't be a, uh, if it's port I.O., you're giving it an I.O. port. And the other option is 1, 1, in which case you're saying break on read or write. And finally, you say, how big of a memory region proximate to this virtual address do I actually care about? And that's good for when you only care about a single byte or some two byte structure. Or something. All right. I know you're almost done at this point. We can get through this. Finally, we just saw the control register, right? This is saying, what do I want to turn on in terms of breakpoints? And so you can go in in the kernel, in any kernel module, and you can access these, you know, things subsequent to, well, subject to whether or not someone has already turned on the global detect flag so that if you try to access it, it causes an interrupt. But most of the time, you can just go ahead and set all, you can go and turn these on manually to your heart's content, or as we will see, you can just set, you know, the debugger to turn it on and we'll see exactly how when we ask the debugger for a break on execute one byte, we'll see exactly how these things change. <coughs> Then the only thing is, because there's all these different types of breakpoints you can set, all those different configurations you can set in the control register, first of all, you need to know, so you need to know when an int 1 happened, what kind of breakpoint was it? Which one fired? What was the type? And all that. Well, it doesn't really tell you the type because you can go look at the control register to find out. But you at least need to know what breakpoint fired. So if I set virtual address A into debug register 0, and I set virtual address B into debug register 1. If virtual address B fires, right, so debug register 1, virtual address was found, it was an execute breakpoint, whatever, then when that int 1 is, when that int 1 is issued by the hardware, it's going to set B1 right here to say breakpoint 1 was just found. Like I said before, you could have the same address for two different types of breakpoints, like we said, write, versus read-write in order to get a read-only kind of thing. So in case where you had two of the same address and two different things, right, it would say B0 and B1 both fired, right? And it's up to you to figure out what that means to you. But it's just trying to tell you, look, I saw the address that you gave me in debug register 0. I saw that address. I saw an execute. I saw it within one byte after that address. I fired the interrupt. I set this to say, look, breakpoint 0 is the one that just fired. Do whatever you're going to do about it. Similarly, BD, that was for that general detect. So if someone said general detect so that they wanted to know when someone tried to write to the debug registers, 
that will cause an interrupt and the hardware will say BD, you know, debug register access detected. So, so I just fired the interrupt and you need to know someone's trying to mess with your debug registers, kill them or compensate or, you know, <laughs> act like kill them is the only solution, but maybe you can negotiate with them. Maybe you can give them equal access and equal time. Damn hippie. <clears throat> Finally, there are two things which invoke two flags that we haven't seen yet in the eFlags register. Break single step. And so this is an interesting one. If this is set, it turns out there was just a single step exception, which is again a type of debug one. So when you go into the debugger and you know you say step over, step over, step into, stuff like that, it turns out the debugger is not setting a software breakpoint for each next instruction and like, you know, moving them along. It's using a different kind of thing called a single step exception in order to fire off a debug one. And uh, in that way, you execute one instruction and then you fire off a debug one. You execute one instruction, you fire off a debug one. This is called single stepping and that's enabled by setting a flag in the eFlags register, which we will see like the next slide. So just keep in mind that there's, you're not using single, you're not using software breakpoints when you hit a breakpoint and go step, 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 step. Behind the scenes, the debugger is smart enough to know, hey, I want to use a single step exception. All right, good. And then BT we don't care about because this is saying break on task switch. So if I am switching between those Intel tasks related to the TSS, which we don't care about, go ahead and uh, you can set a breakpoint on that as well. All right. Right. So we were just talking about the, you know, what happens when you set a hardware breakpoint. So we already mentioned this. If you set a hardware breakpoint, you get an int one occurs, right? So if the hardware all matches up, it sees, I got that virtual address, I got a read access, I got, you know, within four bytes from that virtual address, bang, int one. That's what happens, debug exception. Now, if it is an execute breakpoint, it is a fault, meaning, right, EIP points at, EIP points at the instruction which caused the breakpoint. So I executed this and, and it's important here to say that in an instruction breakpoint, it didn't actually execute that instruction yet. So the breakpoint occurs, it says, you set a breakpoint on, for instance, that pop EAX. And if I had done a hardware breakpoint, it would have given me the interrupt before it actually executed the pop EAX. I would catch the interrupt, I would handle it, and if I want, I can return back and let it execute that pop EAX. So that's slightly different from the way software interrupts will like, you know, put a CC in and then hit the CC and then maybe put back in the original bytes, stuff like that. If you can go, Errol, if you have to go, feel free. Anyone who's got appointments, I'd go for it. So the point here is, and I mean, the videos will be available later so you can catch the last part. All right. And maybe I'll just like keep talking for like half an hour after you guys are gone and then we can like get all this material and you can watch it later. <coughs> all right. It would be awesome. I'll be like blah, 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 blah. That's right. That's right. But the problem is he wants to leave, right? So, but still, if he keeps the camera right here. All right. So when you have a hardware breakpoint that says break on execute, it's a fault, and for everything else, it's a trap. So that was before we said for those data breakpoints, it points at the instruction after the actual write, and maybe you want to know the exact instruction, so you want to turn it from a trap to a fault. And there are means by which to do that. But anyways, because of the case, now here's the, the trickiness here. If you have a break on execute, and if it's pointing at the exact EIP that would have caused that break on execute, but which has not yet executed, right? You, you're tempted to just, you know, okay, I saw that and I'm just going to issue an interrupt return to go back to that instruction and let that instruction execute, right? The problem is, like we said, the hardware is checking for breakpoints before it's allowing code to execute. So if you return from that fault, you get that fault right again, right? So you get an infinite loop if you keep returning to the EIP, which the hardware keeps saying, oh yeah, hardware breakpoint there, return, hardware breakpoint there, return. So that's where a special flag in the eFlags called resume flag comes into play. Resume flag lets you bypass this little interrupt, inter infinite loop thing here. 
So in eFlags, there is a flag which can be set called the resume flag. And what happens when the resume flag is in effect is the hardware knows it needs to execute the next instruction without any sort of hardware breakpoints in effect, but then immediately clear the resume flag and for the next instruction, go ahead and check if it's, you know, a breakpoint on that. And that's how it gets around it. When resume flag is set, the hardware temporarily knows, okay, I can see that this virtual address matches something that you want to break on. I can also see that resume flag is set, so I'll go ahead and clear the resume flag, execute that instruction, and then now I'll move on to the next thing and start again checking the virtual address uh, versus the... Yeah, I think it would be nice if you could leave that on so that they can uh, see the video later. I'll have to double check my flight information. But yeah. So anyways, resume flag. If you are some, you know, interrupt one handler and you're implementing, you know, some hardware breakpoint debugging, you as debugger need to know if I'm going to resume, from, if I'm going to return from an int one on a break on execute, the EIP is a fault, right? It's pointing at the address which caused it. And if I just straight up return back to that EIP, the hardware will just kick off the int one again. Therefore, in order to return, first set the resume flag, then go ahead and return, and everything will be great. It'll ignore breakpoints for exactly one instruction, and then it'll turn them back on again. All right, so you can set the resume flag. Um, yeah. That's interesting. That's conflicting. It's saying you manipulate the you manipulate the flags, you manipulate e flags on the stack and then you call IRET, but then simultaneously this is saying IRET does not, oh, maybe it's, it's probably meaning IRET versus IRET D, so whatever. You mostly just, you modify the e flags on the stack, do some bit math in order to turn on the resume flag, and then do an IRET to return back to the EIP that caused the fault, but then because the resume flag is set, you skip, you know, handling uh, debug interrupts for that single instruction. Finally, the last E flag of the day, and then we will have seen many E flags, is the trap flag. This is another thing where a kernel interrupt handler can set this flag, and when trap flag is set to one, this is how single stepping occurs. So if you set trap flag to one, and you IRET back to wherever you were at the time, the hardware automatically says, oh, trap flag equals one, execute one instruction, int one. Right? And if you set trap flag again the next time you return, oh, in execute one instruction and then interrupt one. So the trap flag is how you get the single stepping mode. It's like you don't want to have to like update the code every time to put CCs in. So therefore you just set the trap flag. It's a temporary thing. The hardware automatically clears it after each, you know, single step that it took. So setting the trap flag says, dear hardware, execute one instruction and then let me know with an int one. And again, it's going to, uh, that's a, you know, it's a good question of whether it points, EIP points at the, uh, that's a fault, not, I'm pretty sure it is still a fault. I think it's still going to be a fault. Anyways, so that's all I want to say about trap flag, just to say that if you set the trap flag, return back, the processor will execute exactly one instruction before Absolutely, no matter what, doesn't care about what hardware breakpoints you set, it'll execute one instruction and then kick off an int one. And that would be a case that's interesting. Well, that would be a case where all of those B0 through B3 are not set, but BT, no, BS for Bingle, uh, break single step. And my mind is really going now. for break single step is saying, you know, the only way that you would know that a single step exception just happened, you know, none of your breakpoint zero through three would be set because this virtual address didn't necessarily match anything you were trying to stop on because you're just, you know, continuing on after something you stopped on. Therefore, the only way you would know that that reason you just got the int one is if you consult the status and see BS is equal to one. That tells you, okay, I'm single stepping and as a debugger, as software which implements debugging, you're always on each interrupt, you're always asking the user, what do you want to do next, right? 
if the user says step one instruction, you know, use the S instruction in, or SI instruction in GDB, or you just click the arrows in, in other things, uh, that's telling the debugger, please debugger, set the trap flag, execute one instruction, and then ask me again what I want to do, right? But if you just say go, then the thing just, you know, sets the resume flag and continues on its merry way. All right. So we're going to quick set some, uh, I think, don't worry about following along on this one. We're going to set some hardware breakpoints in WinDebug and just see if I set this sort of breakpoint, I'm going to see the debug registers change correspondingly, right? So if I set any sort of hardware breakpoint, I expect that debug 0, 1, 2, or 3 is going to be set to the virtual address I ask to break on. So in particular, this is just the syntax of WinDebug. Instead of a normal software breakpoint is BP for breakpoint, a hardware breakpoint is break on access, and then you have to tell it what type of access. Okay, it can be read-write, it can be only-write, it can be execute, or it can be port I.O. So, so then it asks you, then you have to say, okay, what size do I want to break on? One byte, two bytes, four bytes, or maybe eight bytes. Okay, so this is mapping, the syntax of this wind debug command is mapping very one-to-one -one to what we need to set up these debug registers, right? And finally, give it an address, and oh, hey, that's probably the thing which goes into debug register zero, debug register one. All right, so in WinDebug, this is what I used secretly before when I was, like, trying to, you know, break at the exact instruction that an interrupt occurred at. And I should maybe make this point um, strenuously, maybe. If you're trying to debug an interrupt handler, you do not want to use a software breakpoint inside of that interrupt handler, right? Because then you're calling an interrupt inside of an interrupt and badness can happen. Especially you don't want to use it when you're debugging the breakpoint handler. So don't debug an int3 by sticking in an int3 instruction, okay? If you want to debug the interrupt, the int3, use a hardware breakpoint, and then when you hit that actual address, an int1 will kick off, right? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break and so, for instance, I'll show you exactly what I did before when I was trying to set a breakpoint at the beginning of my int ee, which I have hooked. Right? So I can do like bang uh, I, ite, no, sorry, brain dead, idt, and I can say ee to say, tell me, you know, just the basic, like, address where the int ee vector is to. It's going to say, okay, that's fa, like falafel. Uh, it's break on through to the other side plus 630. So this is the only thing I really care about because hardware breakpoints are breaking up virtual addresses. And this is an interesting point as well. I was trying to debug some uh, Windows code one time that was modifying itself. And it turned out, this was in HAL.dll, it turned out that it dropped down to virtual 8086 mode, that other little backwards compatibility 016-bit mode that we talked about briefly. It was dropping down to 16-bit mode. And I, I had set a break on write to memory. I said, I can see that when I call this code, eventually it, like, overwrites some memory. But, like, where does it break on, right? Where does it overwrite that? I want to stop exactly when the HAL.dll code modifies its own memory. Set a break on write, execute, nothing happens. So it's because it's dropping down into virtual 8086 mode, and these hardware breakpoints are looking for virtual addresses, 32-bit virtual addresses. And this thing's dropped down to 16-bit mode. And so, for instance, this also has implications for what if you have memory mapped into different locations, right? Maybe you think the bad guy's code is here, but they've copied it into the different virtual address space with the same physical memory. And because of that different virtual address space, your hardware breakpoint will never hit on it, right? Because different virtual addresses, it's only checking virtual addresses, and all of the virtual to physical manipulations that you can do can make it so the hardware never sees stuff. So for what that's worth, now we're going to do uh, break on access. Um, we want to do an execute. So my access type is execute. My access size is one because WinDebug only lets me set one on execute. And then finally, just the address. So before I execute this command, I'm going to go find my debug registers, my registers window. There they are. Oh. Oh, that's right. I already said it before, right? I said I was telling you that thing I did before. Uh, I'm going to set 
different virtual address, you know, plus one. Right? So we can see that from before. I already have debug register zero filled in with the address I was going to just set. And if I went in and like parsed debug register uh, seven, I would see, you know, what's enabled, what's disabled, stuff like that. But so for now, it suffices for my purposes to say, okay, I want a new uh, breakpoint. And unfortunately, this thing is not uh, updating immediately. So I'm going to like just execute one instruction. I don't know where I am in memory right now. I'm just going to execute one instruction so that the debugger updates its memory. All right, so I'll step over. All right, there we go. So it turns out in this case, and I kind of was guessing this was going to be the case because when I was looking at this bug status or control register, it didn't say the zeroth bit was not set. So neither the zeroth or the first bit were set. So I knew that previous breakpoint was no longer enabled. So there was actually, that thing was still in the debug register, but it wasn't enabled. So I just set a new breakpoint, and now I can see, yes, definitely it did set the local enable zero to tell the hardware, all right, go look at debug register zero, and that's the virtual address I want you to break on. So that's how we saw the offset. And if, for instance, I, I don't know if this is going to work, because I don't know if the first instruction is one byte. But I'm going to like run the, uh, break on through to the other side to call that into EE, and we'll see whether this works or not now that it's pointing at the wrong address. But, all right, where's my break on through to the other side? Or try to run, try to hide, rather. All right. So since this thing continued on and didn't, like, just stop, I know that this breakpoint didn't hit. So let's go ahead and clear that one out and uh, set the correct breakpoint. So I'm going to break, because I want to show you the status register is being updated, right? I expect that the status register B0 should say you had a break on debug register 0. So BC for clear, going to clear everything. Set my access again. Go. Now, within the VM, I'm going to do the try to run, try to hide. So I did it again, and I run, and we don't see that error message because right now this entire VM is stopped. I can't, you know, move anything around. VM is stopped. We are now broken into the kernel debugger because that int1 kicked off. WinDebug caught it, and it says, hey, user, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to single step? Do you want me to continue? What's up? All right. So right now, we're in the debugger. It said breakpoint zero hit because it has like a list of breakpoints, both software and hardware, that you can do breakpoint list. And so right now, I saw that my one is set here. So debug register zero is set. And then right there, the debug status register, the least significant bit, is set to one. That means you had a breakpoint on hardware breakpoint zero, right? Because it is like... like this, right? It's trying to tell me least significant bit, zero, set it to one. That tells you you just had debug register zero, kick off an alert. And so then it's up to you as the, uh, you know, user to decide what you want to do and that sort of thing. All right, so that is pretty much it for hardware breakpoints. And you have some examples in there if you want to play with them. That was us just doing the lab watching the debugger debug. All right, so just a couple of things on the, I already kind of mentioned with debug registers. For instance, there's a packer which sets some data into the debug register zero or one or two or three, and it reads that data back out as part of, you know, a quote, like a key that it uses for unpacking, right? So if you are setting a hardware breakpoint while it's unpacking, it's going to be reading this key out and the key is going to be wrong, right? So it's setting some value that it expects in the debug registers. It's reading it out as it's unpacking. And if it sees, it doesn't have to see anything. If it's reading in the wrong data from those debug registers other than what it set it to, because you, the human, have come along and set a break on access, right, it reads out the wrong data and the unpacking just straight up fails, right? So that one's kind of interesting. And you can uh, see some of these other uh, links in order to find more information about how malware can use 
plug registers, and this right here, this context structure, that's what I was talking about before where uh, the kernel exports to user space this context structure. Context structure has the debug registers, so if user space sets them in there, gets context switched out, context switched in. When it gets context switched in, the hardware, the OS takes all the registers and everything else, the saved state for the uh, process, and it dumps it into all the registers before it says go ahead, go calc.exe. So that's a way that from user space in Windows you can actually set debug registers and you can screw with debug registers. It means your user space code is potentially, you know, messing with your debugging of it. It's malicious code. And finally, we, we talked about single stepping, right? We said typically you, you can use that trap flag to single step and you can tell the debugger move one instruction at a time. But, and in, um, in some cases where you'd like to trace the code, right? You'd like to just let the code run and you want to see which control flow path it takes. How debuggers typically do this when they allow this, they'll, they'll let, you know, the control flow run and they'll maybe give you a nice little graph of like where did all the code execute so you can see if I just let this run, here's the path it takes, but I actually want it to take that path so it turns out I need to set a breakpoint there and force it down that path, something like that. How debuggers typically implement this is that they use single stepping to do that. So they execute it, they, you know, make sure they set the trap flag, execute one instruction, trap flag one instruction. And the point is just at each step, they update their little control flow graph. There is a capability that's added in new hardware where the hardware will actually take source and destination EIPs at control flow transfer instructions for you and put them into a nice little list stored elsewhere in the hardware. So. This is an optimized way so that when your code is executing, it's, you know, walking down and the hardware by itself without having to do an interrupt, an interrupt return each time, will go in there and when it sees a call instruction, it will say, aha, at this virtual address there's a call instruction, that's your source, and here's the destination of the call, continue on, la la la, hit a jump instruction. At this virtual address, there is a jump, at this is the destination of the jump. So this tracing thing, you can go look at this on OpenRCE. He's showing that, you know, when he modified his debugger to use this built-in new capability for tracing, it was like extremely much faster than stopping after every instruction, right? Now the, it's the hardware's problem and the hardware only updates this little list of, uh, what does it call it, a branch trace. It only updates the list of branch traces when it sees a branching instruction and branching instructions are calls, jumps, returns, right? You're branching, you're changing the EIP. There's only so many instructions that can do that. Presumably interrupts as well. Not sure on that though. 